There's a guy out on the West Coast. Now, now just, just one minute now. It's not, it's not what you think. There's a guy out on the West Coast, and he's got the state legislature of his state all excited. He's got 45 angry committees of elderly ladies with flowered hats who are at the ready. This whole formation, this phalanx of humanity, is trying to get a bill passed. They're trying to get it through the state legislature, get it signed, sealed, approved, and put into the state constitution that henceforth, forever and anon, all animals in the zoos in that state should be forced to and will be forced to wear pants. <laughs> now, 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 they're, they're serious about this. In fact, this state, which uh, we will not even name, uh, it doesn't make any difference, you see, because we, we hope to protect the innocent by not naming the state. But this state is very serious about it, and the whole state is in an uproar about whether or not the rhinoceros in the zoo should be allowed to appear in public without his Bermuda shorts. In the summertime, in the wintertime, of course, he can wear his corduroy knickers. Now, uh... <laughs> Now, the intriguing thing about it is that there are a lot of people who are serious about a thing like this, and, and I can understand why. I'll never forget the time I've taken this beautiful China doll chick that I knew at that time. I was going with this girl. She was a lovely, oh, a fantastic girl, and I had borrowed the car. You know, I got my old man's car the first time I'd ever taken the car over the state line. You know, there's a whole mystique about that when you actually cross the state border with the car for the first time. I don't know whether you know anything. It's like soloing for the first time of the car. So I went over the state border in Illinois, out of Indiana, in the Pontiac. We went all the way into the Brookfield Zoo. Now, the Brookfield Zoo is one of these hip modern zoos, you know, where they don't have bars. Yeah, they have moats, things floating around. And once in a while, I see a guy's straw hat going downstream and other things. But they have, they have this moat all around where the animals are. Now, the animals live apparently in their own natural habitat. And you know what animals are like in their own natural habitat. So on a Sunday afternoon, I took this girl whose name was Dorothy, and she was made of, out of all kinds of stuff. Made out of sort of this China stuff, you know, with the, with the, with the fluffy dresses that break. And, uh, you know, the kind of crack that are on the bottom of lamps with the funny little, you know, the kind of lamps that they put in, in bedrooms. She was that kind of a girl, really, seriously. Funny thing. Little did I realize, though, she was solid stainless steel underneath it all. That is another story, which we'll relate later at a different time when the, when the scars are finally healed. That's another five years, but that's another thing. Uh, anyway, I take this chick there, you know, and everything is swinging. And I get the car parked, and we walk in through, and I pop for the, uh, you know, I pop for the, the good humor bars. And uh, I get the thing all, all, all set. We, we make the reservation. They had they one of these outdoor restaurants there in the zoo. And this outdoor restaurant had monkeys in the trees and parakeets. And it was a great thing, you know, and you had to come in, you had to make the reservation early. So I made the reservation, I was really popping for the whole thing. I was going the whole route, three bucks and a half right down the rat hole, just like that. And so we get in and we're walking along, along this long curved thing that went through. It was beautiful, it was, it was a reproduction of one of the main streets in Nairobi. And uh, that's a very beautiful street. And we're walking along the street and we came to the place where the rhinoceroses were. I guess it's rhinoceroses, or is it rhinoceri? Uh, you know, what, what is more than one rhinoceros together outside of being frightening? There is a name. I mean, it's rhinoceri or is it rhinocerae? Rhinoceroses. That's more like it. It's rhinoceroses. So uh, there were there were two or three rhinoceroses fooling around there, grunting. Bleh, bleh. You know how rhinoceroses do that. Wow, 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 wow. One is digging a hole. And all of a sudden, one of those rhinoceroses, oh, what a terrible thing. What an awful thing. It must have gone on for about four hours, it seemed like. And we're just standing there. And it's going on and on and on. And it's just going on and on. I mean, those rhinoceroses are terrible people. And I can understand why those people on the West Coast are demanding that they wear pants. Not only should they have to wear pants, but, 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 but. Hold it, hold it. Well, our relationship was never the same after that, me and this chick. And, uh, no, this was the turning point, uh, I suspect, in our relationship. Up to that time, it had been the, the ivory pedestal all the way. Well, the way this chick laughed, the way this chick roared and would not leave that place, she hung onto that fence where that rhinoceros continued to, oh, it was just a dis, oh, what a disgusting display. I can't, oh, that's a fantastic. And, and I, of course, I was changing colors uh, momentarily, like every three milliseconds. I was a different shade. I could feel it. You know, when your ears are starting to swell, 
You know that terrible feeling? Your teeth are itching and you can feel steam coming out of your, out of your ears and your, your pants start itching over the top of your kneecaps. And I'm standing there and this rhinoceros is going on and on. She just stood there and belted it out and laughed and hollered and yelled. And for, for hours after that, she would not let me forget this incident. Well, I have never, ever actually forgotten it. Now, the idea of, of putting pants on animals illustrates a beautiful principle that is rampant today in our world. Now, this principle cannot be explained in words. It cannot be put into three or four choice phrases. It can be, it can be more, let's say it can be more demonstrated than discussed. Uh, for example, in, the, in the very much the same, you don't really believe that putting pants on chimpanzees is going to change chimpanzees or people who watch them, do you? It's only going to make it worse. You understand that? You realize that's going to make it worse? I mean, if you see a gorilla wearing, a, believe me, if you see a, a gorilla wearing a, a Claire McArdle skirt, that's going to change gorillas. Everybody's going to differ. The uh, next thing you know, I'm, believe me, you're going to have a whole new class of crimes develop. A whole new thing is going to start bring, breaking out in zoos. And I'm just saying this is the way it is. All because some right thinker came along. Figured he was going to fix it. It's like the old bathtub gin principle. You know that I'd say a good 75% of America did not discover drinking until they passed a law that said they couldn't do it. They didn't even know about drinking. And all of a sudden they found out about it in Milan, Indiana, because they came around and asked them if they, if they think it should be illegal to drink. And nobody thought anything about it. They've been drinking weak milk, you know, up to this point. And once in a while, some ro- muddy river water out of the little Miami. Occasionally, they knock down some knee-high orange. They said, what do you mean, uh, uh, against the law? What law? They said, well, we're going to pass law to get, get rid of that drinking. All that terrible drinking, carousing around on Saturday nights. Well, they didn't do any carousing around on Saturday nights in Milan, Indiana. So everybody standing around the street court said, what's all this about? They said, well, you know all that drinking gin. Gin, what's gin? Well, gin, uh, gin, well, I'll tell you, I understand that if you go down to Indianapolis, you can try some of it and then figure out if you want to be against it or not. And so the entire town, one Saturday night, went to Indianapolis to try gin to discover whether or not it was against it. Well, three days later, when they got back, uh, they, they, they decided they'd better be against it for that while, because their heads was a-throbbing, their eyeballs was a-bugging out, and, and it was terrible. The whole world was bloodshot for a couple of days there, and they were against it. Well, the trouble is that the law was passed, the law was passed on a Wednesday, and by Friday night they began to reconsider. Their tongues was thick, but their appetites were swinging. And by Saturday morning they were all back in Indianapolis. And do you know that the entire southern half of Indiana spent the entire period of the 1920s in Indianapolis? Are you aware of that? They discovered it, you see, the minute they put the law against it. Well, now, now this principle, you see, can, can, as I say, be more illustrated than actually discussed. Did you read the, the latest bit of sad, wonderful, oh, it's, it, it, it's, there's a certain kind of sadness about it that, well, it's, it, I don't know whether it, it, it occurs to you or do, or do you feel the same sadness about this thing that I do. It's not, it's the funny kind of sadness, though. It's the kind of sadness that, that makes people feel that if they pass the right law, it's all okay now. Everything's Jake. If you pass the right law in Alabama, everything swings now. Or if you, if you get, the, if you get the right slogan up, it's all going to be squared away. Uh, many, and many a poor sad business right now is going down the drain because they're turning out, they're turning out rotten stuff. But they're working on trying to get together a good presentation to put it over. They're trying, they're, they're working like mad day and night. They're hiring PR people to try to make it go, knowing full well secretly that it's not going to. Did you read about this sad thing? Amy Vanderbilt is going to go on a bus cross town, and she's going to ride uptown a couple of times, and she's going to write a thing about how people should start behaving good in buses. Somehow, this completely misses the whole idea of what people are about or what people are going to be about and why people do things. She thinks that they push each other because they don't know that they shouldn't push. You understand what I'm saying here? That if you tell them, don't push each other, they, oh, I never thought of that. Oh, for crying out loud, I never thought about not hitting the ladies in the face. Oh, for crying out Thank you, Amy. Yeah. Oh, okay, we'll straighten that out. Please, get it out of your skull. And yet, New York is filled with this stuff. You go up and down 6th Avenue, and you're knee-deep in cigar butts and, 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 uh, 
and beer cans and all kinds of stuff. And there's a great big sign on, at the end of the street and it says, Make New York a cleaner place in which to live. And I can just see some guy about to throw out six empty beer cans and he sees this big sign that says, Make New York a... Oh, I never thought of that, not throwing the beer cans out. Put the beer cans on the floor, but there. Will you stand like, put them on the floor there? No, I'm sorry. This is the saddest, the saddest, uh, in a way, the saddest comment on our 20th century life of all. We really feel that we can, honestly, we can change man. We honestly feel that we can engineer him. We really feel that we're going to be able to control all of these things. Speaking of sadness, this is WORAM and FM New York. And uh, don't forget you'll never change this crowd here, believe me. Uh, this uh, WOR is not a radio station. It's a dynastic ascension. It's a very different thing. Do not uh, don't 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 rock the boat here. I'm serious. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not arguing. I, I have, have you ever have you ever thought about you know radio is only around since well what 1921. This station started in 1921. Well, has it occurred to you that there will be a day when radio stations and television stations are 950 years old? And they're celebrating their 900th anniversary. See, Americans are not concerned with time. They don't believe that kind of time passes. Well, it will, Dad. And 900 years from now, there'll be, there'll be John Gambling, the 38th, on there in the morning, see, and he'll be playing the Vienna Woods and, and all that wonderful, uh, reading Westport school announcements. And it'll be a long ascension. And like, of course, like fish, you understand that as it goes through an evolutionary process, finally the various things are lost that were originally very important. You know, the, the gill covers and one thing or another. I don't know how the, the uh, John Gambling is going to sound uh, 3,000, let's say in the year 3,062. I don't know what it's going to sound like. But it'll be the same thing, I can assure you. Basically, basically the same tapes will be on there, and the Norman Luboff Choir will continue. However, <laughs> you know, it, it is an interesting thing to think about a television station 860 years old. And they're digging back in the ancient files, like the old archives. They're uncovering ancient television uh, artifacts, like old kinescopes, you know, and, and, and dusty old terrible program logs that are all... And, and they'll be in museums. They will. Seriously, this microphone will be in a museum. And I'm convinced the tapes of my radio show will be in museums a thousand or five hundred years from now. Uh, I, I really am. And everyone's uh, the, the lap. And it's not because they're good or bad or anything else. They, it, it is because it is a part of a time that will have its moment and be gone. It'll be gone. Oh, oh speaking of Amy, before we go any further in, in television, this is a time out now from Word for TV Guide magazine. This week, TV Guide profiles the butt of a thousand jokes. Accordion player turned entrepreneur Lawrence Welk. In a candid, hard-hitting interview, Welk Turn tells us all how he's learned to laugh <laughs> at his being fair game for jokesters. I tell you, if that guy ever learns to play the accordion, he's done. I'm serious. Uh, families who buy and rely on TV Guide each week join the over 8 million literate Americans who rely on TV Guide to lead them out of the wilderness each week on sale everywhere, 15 cents. Yeah, put out your hand. It's TV Guide in the dark to lead you there into the light. Speaking of light, uh, there was a piece in the post. I want to read this to you. It, it illustrates. I'm, I'm curious, which do you think is the most realistic? Amy. Oh, one more thing before we go into this Amy thing. I wish I had the piece from the New York Times, but it said something so poignantly true about our time as to be unbelievably to the point. Uh, it's the kind of stuff that never winds up in the editorial pages of any newspaper, but really should. Amy Vanderbilt was going to make a trip at 11 a.m. this morning, cross town on the 34th Street bus. Did you know that? Oh, yes. And upon that experience, she was going to write a book on how, uh, at least a pamphlet, on how bus riders should behave. Now, the city officials were afraid that if she got on a bus, she's liable to get on a bus where nobody was hitting anybody. Or if she did get on a bus where they were hit, and they're liable to hit her. So you know what they did? You will not believe this. A group of bus officials were traveling cross town with her, enacting and reenacting the typical things that bus riders do on cross town trips. And from watching this reenactment, she's going to write the book. You understand what I'm trying to say about our time now? 
Do you realize that about 75% of our attitude towards the world is based on that kind of jazz? Do you realize that this kind of expertise is what is slowly swallowing us up and devouring us? It's this kind of, uh, a kind of Earl Wilson, Dorothy Kilgallen, Leonard Lyons attitude towards the world that eventually is going to put us right, it, it, we're going to be sucked right into a maelstrom that none of us can ever get out of? Do you realize this? It's sad but very true. And, and all the while, the cosmonauts whistle over, and we say, well, they don't have shoes. That's all right. I'm, I'm, I'm quite convinced that some Russian says, well, they got plenty of shoes, but no cosmonauts. <laughs> Depends on what you want, Dad. You better be careful. You better be awfully careful. Anyway, here was a little bit in the post written by a guy named David Gelman. And it starts with a quotation. Did Amy Vanderbilt ever drive a crosstown bus on 34th Street? Asked the driver of the crosstown bus on 34th Street. A reporter had just informed him that Amy Vanderbilt, the etiquette authority, was writing, at the request of the transit authority, a canon of courtesy for New York City bus drivers and bus riders. It was hot. In the middle of 2 p.m. traffic on 34th Street yesterday, it seemed even hotter on a bus filled with lurching passengers, some strap hangers slowly slipping off their soggy straps. It seemed hotter still. The driver was in foul humor. He wasn't even talking to his passengers. He was barely talking to the reporter, who sat behind him badgering him with inane questions. He was answering the questions with questions, which is a well-known forensic trick. Did he feel that riders were more to blame than drivers for attrition on the buses? Where does Amy Vanderbilt live? He asked. Gracie Square, said the reporter. Down by the river? Asked the driver. Up by the river, said the reporter. Brief pause. Cooler, ain't it? Well, cooler than here. She live in a city long? He is now approaching 8th Avenue. The riot is approaching its climax on the 34th Street bus. It is 14 degrees cooler the minute you get west of 5th. You understand that, don't you? In one way, and 35 degrees hotter in another. It depends on how you, what your attitude is towards the cool world, Dad. That's another world. He is in the middle of it right now on 34th Street. She live in the city long? Just moved back this year after 18 years in Westport. Where? Westport. Oh! She ever ride a bus? Well, she says she's been riding the Madison Avenue bus occasionally. And the one through Central Park on 86th Street, I think. And on the 5th Avenue bus sometimes. She got any complaints? That isn't the word he used, but for the purposes of editorial discretion, we are using that word. She got any complaints? Uh, it, it, it's a word that is perfectly usable among dog raisers. But uh, among people who are discussing Amy Vanderbilt, that's another problem. You do not uh, approach it from that direction. She got any complaints? She says they still have the yellow... Will you, uh, hold it, lady! Get back on the bus! Get back! All right, what would you say? She says they still have the yellow markings on the curbs where the buses used to stop, and a lot of people get confused. Yeah, is that my fault? No, but she says she's going to observe the buses for a few weeks and then write this cannon of a courtesy. A what about courtesy? Cannon? You mean a gun? No, cannon. Rolls. Oh. What she know about it? Long silence. Reporter answers. She writes a syndicated column on courtesy and etiquette that appears in a billion papers. She wrote a book about that that sold a million of copies or more, or maybe a billion. Oh, yeah, that make her an expert, huh? She ever been on 34th Street? Shut up! Will you get back on the bus? You ever been on 34th Street? Will you close the door, lady? We can't wait here all the time. Either get in or get out. No, we do not stop. This is a cross-town bus, lady. No. Why don't you read the sign? It's a sign that says 34th Street Crosstown. See, we are not the Fifth Avenue bus. We do not go to Saks. Get out or get in. Thank you. Now, does she ever ride his bus, huh? Look, look, buddy, I could write a book on courtesy, man. Will you move back in a bus? Now, look, we got to get going here. Now, move back and have your change in your hand, will you? 
No, lady, we do not take transfers on cross-town buses. How many times do you have to be told that? Why don't you read this sign? It's just right out there in the front. No, no transfer. See, it's right there on the machine there. Okay, fine. All right, thank you. God. No, we cannot break $10 bills. I do not have that kind of change. You know, you know what goes on these buses, man? That's Amy Vanderbilt? No, okay. Well, then why does she write a book? I can write a book. The reporter asked, what goes on? With that, he threw a discreet glance over his shoulder and said, Soto Voce, they're animals. Animals, all of them. They're animals. Every one of them is animals. <laughs> Write a book about them. They're animals. Don't you understand? Look at them, animals. Go oh, back in the bus, you slob. Get off my foot. I'm going to get this thing moving. Yeah. They're animals. Are you going to write a book about it? Animals. <laughs> and the bus continued on 34th Street into the darkness. <laughs> Well, you see, Amy, well, I guess it's not, this is the fun and games division of mankind. The fun and games division is the one where people make wonderful slogans and put things up on signs and, and where people write editorials about how we should return to the basic precepts of our founding fathers. Uh, all those wonderful, nice, comforting, warm things, but have absolutely no, I repeat, no relationship to the lives that any of us live. Just like, just like most of our education has nothing to do with the lives that we live. You know, education, and, and oh by the way, I think, I think the next five minutes of the show will be done just for kids. Kids, listen. There's a lot of stuff, that, uh, oh, just a tremendous amount of stuff that your old man won't tell you. See, because he has never admitted it to himself. Now, you won't learn this stuff in school. It's a kind of education that has to do with learning how to be a human being, how to live in the jungle that we all live in. Now, I'm not discussing the jungle of the city. I'm not discussing the jungle of the country. I'm discussing the process of being alive and being a man. We are a predatory creature. You understand that, don't you? Your father hardly ever admits to that. But the predator in us is the strongest thing that we have. We have very sharp teeth, you know. And we have big eyes, as they say over in another part of town, for each other's lives in one way or another. Now, how do you learn these things? Well, the only way, kid, that I can tell you you learn these things is by hanging around. And eventually you will arrive at a point in your life where you will know a lot of things. Now, most of these things you will never, ever put into words. And, in fact, you will generally become very angry if other people put them in words. Because somehow it's much easier to walk around the facts of what you are than to concede what you are. For example, there is an outfit in Norway that has just set up a commission that is devoted to trying to figure out why people have wars. Well, now, I think it's pretty understandable. I think it's pretty easy to understand why people have wars. But somehow we want to pretend that it's difficult to understand this thing. Because it makes it more mysterious and then it also makes it easier to have wars if we can pretend that we don't understand. Now each one of us has a secret desire to kill somebody else given the right circumstances. And the right circumstances happen far oftener than you would believe. Now we kill each other in other ways here in a democracy. Like for example, oh, we fire each other from time to time that many an executive finds that his killing and his killer, uh, his killer instinct is beautifully assuaged by firing two or three guys every couple of months. Now, in our world, that is the equivalent of killing a man. Interestingly enough, in a world that has devoted itself almost entirely to status, status means having a place, you know. Uh, status symbols are signs of that place. Uh, if you have a desk that is of a certain size, that is not a status in itself. That is a symbol of a status. You follow what I'm saying here? Well, now, now these things are very complicated, kid, and I'm not, I'm not about to tell you that you are a killer, except that you know it. Uh, there isn't one of you who doesn't know it. Uh, as you get older, though, you will forget that, or at least you will pretend to forget it. Then you will be called what everyone uses, well, the phrase that is used in magazine jargon, you will be called mature. Uh, that means that you have been able to successfully not only fool the neighborhood, but yourself. 
Well, then eventually you will arrive at another point. This is a point where things are not working out so good anymore. Now you are a much older man. In fact, you are probably what they call an old man in our society. An old man in our society is anybody roughly over 45. The minute you become old, then you have another completely different attitude towards things. That will be explained in a later lecture. Your old man, by the way, is now watching a Priscilla Lane movie. Make sure when the next, when the next commercial break comes up that he has a cold beer. Then he will not bother you at your radio listening. Uh, incidentally, he probably feels you are wasting your time here. Well, you are, actually, because the things that I'm telling you are things you will have to learn yourself. Now, let me tell you how I learned something about This is uh, Lesson 46. Uh, this one will not appear on the exams. However, it could very well influence a few of the orals we will have later on in the semester. I'm this kid, see. Now, I'm not so much of a kid as you are. Because kids in my time were not as much kids as kids are today. A kid today remains a kid roughly till he's 32, uh, after which point uh, he stops. Oh, yes, uh, Kerouac is still a kid, and Kerouac is pushing 50, I guess, by now. But that's that's another story. Uh, kids, kids remain kids forever today in this day of Pepsi-Cola. I think it's something they put into the Coke, or is it the Pepsi? Is it the Pepsi where you think young? I believe that's the one, yes. Uh, there are other drinks, kid, you will find that make people think other ways. But uh, <laughs> they can often be much more fun than to think young. But that's another story, too, and I'm not one to lead you down that path. However, uh, it's funny when the, when they mix some of those things with Pepsi-Cola. Not only do they think young, but they think something else, and the next thing you know, it's Mount Vesuvius all over the place. Everybody's blown up. Well, that's <laughs> we don't want to bring that into that. That will not come up on the exam, but it's just a parenthetical remark there. But I'm this kid once, you see, and I'm in the Army. Now, I want to point out to you that the Army was a different Army than the one that all the guys seem to be complaining so bitterly about. This was for, was for keeps. Now, I, I don't know whether you know the difference between being in the Army for keeps or being in the Army for to go to Fort Dix for six months until you can finally finish up at Princeton. That's a very different Army, I'd like to point out. And for some reason or other, the guys who are in that one seem to resent it more than the guys that were in the one for keeps. Strangely enough. In fact, I had a guy look me right in the eye not more than two weeks ago, and he says, yeah, but you guys were lucky. You didn't realize how lucky you were. You guys had a reason for being there. You guys had something to fight for. You guys were in the Army for a reason. I'm not in the Army for a reason. That's what bothers me. You, you, you guys had it easier than we did. And I can only think back of three years, three years and endless companions whom I will never have another beer with. Now, that... That maybe was more fun, I suppose, in a way, to those who will never face that, I hope. But nevertheless, I would like to point out that the army that I was in was one for keeps. And as a matter of fact, getting into this particular army at this point, uh, it was at a point in the war when they used to refer to something called Festung Europa. Uh, do you know about Festung Europa? Well, that's Fortress Europe. Uh, Fortress Europe, it was like, it was like, a, it was a fantastic pillbox, a gigantic pillbox. Uh, that was all of Europe. It was one big pillbox, and it was unapproachable. Now, the, the idea was that they were grooming you to hurl yourself against the walls of this thing, this Fortress Europa, which was highly theoretical. Uh, as a matter of fact, I'll never forget one day we're sitting in the, what they call orientating us. Uh, there's a certain language that the Army has, and that <laughs> orientating does a lot of things. And one of the things that I was orientated to was life, among other things. Uh, there was a picture that they showed on the wall of a group of German soldiers. I'll never forget this. Uh, they said, uh, the, the, uh, the colonel was out there. He said, men, I'm going to now show you a film that all you men should see. It's a part of our orientation course, and uh, let me tell you one thing now. This orientation jazz is a new thing in the Army. But one thing about this orientation thing, it's going to get you all set for when you have to go into the real war. And now, uh, Corporal, will you turn on the machine back there? These men are going to be orientated. Well, on came this picture, and it showed it was a fuzzy picture, and it fluttered. Well, it uh, didn't have any sound which was scary because we'd all been brought up in the, you know, it was, we were strictly Errol Flinsville where guys holler and yell and people. It was very silent. And for some reason or other, because it was silent, it was even scarier. It showed a group of German soldiers viewed from the shore of a river. And these guys were spreading out. And uh, we could see the backs of their helmets, that great big coal scuttle, you know. 
And these guys are swimming across this river. There's about nine or ten of them, and they're fanning out in the water, and they're carrying things. Well, up on the, up on the shore, on the opposite shore, you could see a little white thing in the, in the woods there. And the little white thing, from where I was sitting, looked like a concrete impregnable pillbox. Well, these German soldiers were moving in on it. And that uh, we're all sitting there, and it was dark in this tin house where we were watching it. And the wind was howling on the outside, and once in a while you could hear, you could hear the doors banging, and you could hear a squad going past occasionally. And you could hear guys talking on the way to the PX, and we were being orientated. And I was sitting there with, with my helmet between my knees, and, and propped up next to me, I had a 1903 Enfield rifle that had a very, a very rattly bolt. And I might also point out that it was accurate, it was accurate well, I'd say it was accurate within six inches at a range of over 40 feet. And I was sitting there with my, with my rifle next to me. And that was my weapon. Or as they said, your piece. That was my piece that I was going to carry throughout the great conflict in Festung Europa. I had also strapped to me, I had my gas mask. I had on the other side of me my little medical kit, which was given to me the very first day I got in the army that contained several little ampules of morphine, among other things. It also contained a great big bandage that you would roll out, and would, it was called a self-manage, and it would roll out, and it had sulfonilamide that would squirt out all over everything. Well, we're sitting there watching, and all the while my gas mask kept digging me in the ribs, and sitting next to me is Carl Zinsmeister, who had glasses that weighed at least a half a pound, big, thick glasses, and he had his end field next to him. And next to Zinsmeister was a guy named Nash, who had also glasses, and who also had an end field 03, but Nash had one thing wrong with him. He breathed in a kind of a squeaky way. So Nash is sitting down there squeaking away, breathing. Zinsmeister is trying to straighten his glasses. He was one of those guys who always feel if he grabs his glasses and pushes them in the right angle someday, everything is going to come into focus. As far as I know, it never did. All the years I knew Zinsmeister. I'm sitting there next to him, and even at that time I had a bad knee. It was a mental bad knee. It was, a, it was a, a, perhaps a symptom of things to come later. And so I'm surrounded by my peers. All of us had just been recently removed from places like Hammond High School, Griffith, Indiana High School, Laurel, Indiana High School, Sen High School, Lane Tech High School, Roosevelt High School. And there were even a couple of people there, I suspect, from Lucy Flower Tech from the north side of Chicago, which is a girls' school. And so we're all sitting there watching this thing go on. The little machine is fluttering, and these Germans are swimming across the river. Well, they fanned out when they hit the opposite shore, and suddenly you saw, coming out of this little white pillbox, you saw little tongues, little tongues of white going. And you saw tracers coming across the river directly at the camera. They had spotted the cameraman, apparently, who was operating the camera and who was photographing the mission. But they had not spotted the six or eight Germans who were now crawling up the bank. This, incidentally, was taken from actual battle films as part of the Maginot Line break. And the Germans are now crawling up. Each German has dragged behind him what appears to be a long piece of wood or pipe. Maybe seven or almost. Some of them look as long as six or eight feet long. But they're dragging these things behind them. They're crawling up. And suddenly, one German got up. He ran forward. And as he angled forward, carrying this thing, rushing towards this white pillbox... The flames suddenly turned and came out of another direction, and the German went down. And the other two Germans slowly worked their way back down and began to swim across the river back towards us. And the film fluttered out, and the lights came up. We had just seen the Germans, the German engineers, in a Bangalore attack. Do you know what is the Bangalore attack? Well, a Bangalore attack is a torpedo that was based on an well, the, the name refers to a fort in India. And uh, a group of English soldiers many years ago attacked this fort uh, for the good of the empire by carrying torpedoes attached to a long wooden pole. When it became obvious they could not breach the gap, the, the soldiers gave their lives by grabbing this pole and running forward and slamming it into the gate until, boom, it blew up, and then the Queen's own were able to march in and take the fort. That was a Bangalore torpedo. Well, we sat there. And the uh, colonel got up. Is that men? 
Uh, that is the orientation film now. I want, I want all of you, uh, a corporal, will you pass the pieces of paper down to the men there? We're going to have a question and answer period. Well, I don't think there were many questions that could have been asked, nor any answers that could have been given. Uh, we were, it was a peculiar moment. Uh, Carl sat next to me with his steamy glasses, and Nash sat next to me and wheezed. And we laughed it up a little bit, and 15 minutes later we're down on the PX buying Milky Way candy bars. We were on our way. Well, I'd like to tell you a little bit about on our way. Four or five months later, the same group of guys, including me, including Zinsmeister, and including Nash, arrived in a strange little camp down in the middle of Florida. This camp, Raj, I would say six or eight chapters should be done and will be done on this show eventually about it. But this camp was in the middle of the Everglades, hot and steamy. I remember some things about it. It was a very secret camp, and we were very carefully brought into this camp and culled, each one of us. We were to be highly secret, technical radar men, not radar operators, but theoreticians and mechanics and installers and operators of a very special type. We had been weeded out of maybe a 100,000 people in the Army. And, again, this is part of education. Be careful of the weeding process. And so we arrived in the heat one day, and all of us embarked from a train, a strange train that came in through the siding and was in, in the middle of a low series of sand dunes, low tents, all painted brown and green. And we were near the coast of, of Florida and in a highly, highly restricted area. We were, we were inspected four times before they even let us inside the gates, which were all camouflaged. People could drive 20 feet away from the camp and never see it. Well, three or four hours later, we're sitting in a room, and they're classifying us. And they're calling our names out. I'm sitting next to Zinsmeister, whom I've been with ever since I got in the Army, and Nash, who somehow had arrived at the school where I had been going before I went into the Army, was sitting on the other side of Zinsmeister, as he always did. And there we were, sitting. And they were calling out our names, one after the other. And as we were called up, we were given a card. Some guys were given a green card. Some guys were given a yellow card. Other guys were given a pink card. And it was that way that we were separated into vast areas of life. The green card stood for gun direction. The yellow card stood for airborne. And the pink card stood for reporting. Three separate worlds. Gun direction is a radar set that literally operates guns. You are in the front lines in a gun direction unit. Airborne? Well, I got a yellow card. It was for airborne. Nobody knew much about airborne. I was in airborne. And immediately I began to sweat. Airborne. Airborne. And somebody in the, in the room says, ah, don't worry about it, Mac. Airborne, that's a great stuff. You work on all these altimeters. It's wonderful stuff. B-29s, B-17s, all are wonderful. It's clean and you eat good. Well, I was given a yellow card. Nash, however, was given a green one. Zinsmeister was also given a yellow card. And forever and a day from that minute on, Nash became a separate man and a separate world. An hour later, they called him in and asked him whether his insurance was at its maximum. And he came back to the barracks and said, they called me in about my insurance. What is it? What is it? Did they call you in, Shep, about your insurance? He says, no. How about you, Zen? No. He was the only one that got one of the green cards. Well, we were working away. And you know, you kind of forget about these things. You forget. Because you get involved in your work. And I think this is what makes people go to wars. And one of the things that makes wars possible. People become involved in the technique. They forget completely the end result. They get involved in designing a better airplane. They get involved in learning how to drive one. They get involved in learning about gun sights. They get involved in learning about radar. And so it was that I became involved in the altimeter. In the FM altimeter. The 695 and the SCR 717. I became involved in the dish. I became involved in the microwave techniques that were involved. And I became deeply involved. And so did Zinsmeister. And so did poor little old Nash. Well, this went on for about two or three, maybe four months. And then suddenly one day, Nash came in to the barracks. And he said, fellas, 
I just got a direct commission. This was a fantastic thing. We were all corporals struggling away in the heat. And Nash came in with a direct commission. He says, yeah, they just called me in and said I was going to become a warrant officer, junior grade, a direct commission. I'm a direct commission. I'm moving out and going to the BAQ, BOQ. And we couldn't believe it. This was the most greatest thing that ever happened. And sure enough, Nash left that afternoon. And a couple of days later, I seen Nash down in the old PX. Funny thing about that PX, let me tell you about that someday. I can always remember the sound of a record playing over and over and over again in that PX. And the taste of warm Cokes. And that record was a record called Pistol Pack and Mama. Did you ever hear the tune? With Bing Crosby and the Andrews sisters. Over and over and over. Well, there I see old Ted Nash. And he's got a pair of green glasses and brand new, beautiful, beautiful suntans, all cut nice. And he's now a brand new warrant officer, junior grade. And you didn't know how to talk to him. Well, a couple of days later, Nash disappeared. Nash, with his whole group, left. They left two months before we did. And it was because they were a special group. They'd been specially trained, and he never told us much about it. And I remember walking down the street one night after watching watching a movie in the PX down there at the Post Movie House. It must have been about four weeks later when I meet this guy on the street and he says, Hey, did you hear about Nash? I said, What about Nash? Nash used to live above me, you know. He slept above me and he looked like David Niven, only about a foot and a half shorter and spoke with a Memphis accent. I said, Well, don't you know what happened to Nash? Nash and his group went into Sicily. They lasted five minutes. And somebody came down to the barracks and was looking for some of the stuff that he left there the day after that. I'll never forget. I learned something. I don't know what, but I learned.